It is our pleasure uh, to present this program, Silent Tears, The Last Yiddish Tango, uh, with the World Music Institute. And I can't thank you enough for all the work you do introducing the world and, of course, people in New York to some of the best music from around the globe. Tonight's project is based on two sources. Um, Dr. Paula David's poetry project with women who are Holocaust survivors at a Jewish retirement home here in Canada, and Holocaust survivor and author Molly Applebaum. She's the author of the book Buried Words. As a child, she was buried underground on a farm in Poland. And later in the program, we're going to learn about her incredible story. She's 92 and lives here in North Toronto. To begin the program, I want to introduce Dr. Paula David, retired professor of social work um, from the University of Toronto who led the Holocaust Survivor Poetry Project, and many of those works became the material for the Silent Tears Project. Thanks, Dan. It's really a pleasure and such an honor for me to be here to see what happened and what has evolved from work that I did a couple of decades ago when I was working at a long-term care center in Toronto. And at that time, it was the beginning of the Holocaust survivors aging traje trajectory and looking for age-related health services. This was a new group for us to work with. And I started a group for Holocaust survivors at their request. And it was probably the most compelling adventure of my career. And that for a year, we had a group going with about 15 to 20 Holocaust survivors, and nobody would talk to me. As a social worker and a group worker, that makes it a bit difficult. Eventually, I found out they were trying to protect me from the horror of their experience and their stories. And eventually, they did start talking to each other and to me. And we were all in awe of the depth of the challenge of their stories. Eventually, a way to help us all cope for them to be able to keep speaking, for me to be able to hear what they were saying, I started taping their sessions and writing down various things that they had said by theme, putting it together, excuse me, putting it together thematically, and then coming back the next week and say, I have a poem for you to read. And they said, not us, we don't do poetry. And eventually they recognized their thoughts and words. And we titled this a collective poem. And that was how we structured for over a year, all of our sessions, talking, then collecting their thoughts and then writing a collective poem, bringing it back to them, letting them change and edit only what they said. And we ended up with a book of incredibly strong telling and for many of them, the first revealing of their full stories that they'd ever done. It was um, an act that sort of stimulated everybody around them. It would helped people working with survivors and gave them a whole new status in the community. And now flash forward several years later, later these women have all passed away and um, the book has been put to rest. Generally, it sits in libraries, but I haven't heard much about it. And I met Dan, and it's now become a massive rebirth of the book, Regeneration and Reaching Out to a Whole New Group of People via Music. So it's an, been an incredible experience for me. And the music is riveting. And in the past several months, we've seen a whole new audience who are truly listening in a very unique and different way moving forward into the next generation. So thank you, Dan, and the musicians involved. It's quite an incredible experience. Thank you so much, Paula. I want to introduce the first song in the program, and it's the title track from the album. It's called Silent Tears, and it addresses a source of anxiety and fear in women Holocaust survivor stories, and that is losing their children or being separated from them um, as part of the Paula's poetry project. It tells the story of a young mother on the run from the Nazis in a forest in Poland. Her children are starving, and so she decides to leave them briefly to go try and steal some food at a nearby farm. When she comes back, 
they're not there. And they have to search for each other in silence for fear of being discovered. Rebecca Wolkstein had to compose this and she did an incredible job of capturing these emotions, the horror of being separated from your children, what it is like searching without being able to call out for each other. Um, for those who don't speak Yiddish, uh, the end of the song, they are reunited and they cry in each other's arms silently, silent tears. In Vault Fiotek Hallein. Drei Kinder aus gehungert, nicht da wohin zu gehen. Gemüse dort verlassen und gehen noch Spaß in Dorf. Gegangen auf Sokones, zurück und sei nicht tot. Nicht tot, mit Toren noch nicht schreien. Wir können sie nicht rufen, sein Stier ist man genäut. Jeder Schock ich steut, sie werden nicht zurück. Oi, wird man sie verkappen, oi, wird man sie durchschießen. Lenka Lichtenberg, Rebecca Wolkstein, violin, Robert Horvath on piano. Now, one of the reasons why we did this project was not just to share the stories of what happened to women during the war, but to also talk about the long-term trauma people <laughs> deal with decades later uh, if they were children during the con a conflict such as this. 
So, Paul, I wanted to ask you, as a social worker and dealing with these survivors for so many years, can you talk about the long-term trauma that survivors suffer from and deal with it and how you tried to help them? Sure. Well, there are different types of trauma. And sadly, most of everything we know about trauma today, we've learned from the extreme trauma that very few people managed to literally survive that happened during the Holocaust. The whole idea of PTSD came out of the World War I, actually, and it was based around war. Since then, we have learned a great deal. And what we've learned over the life course of survivors, there are different ages and stages. And of course, different people are impacted differently. So much depends on their life before the war started, before the trauma hit them, um, what country they lived in, what their individual experience was, and then what happened in the way their life unfolded afterwards. So the commonality was, however people coped with trauma and in general, the medical psychiatric consensus right after the war was nobody would really live more than 10 years anyway. They couldn't survive that and they were wrong. And the group of survivors that around the globe generally did prove early research wrong. They proved what humanity has the capacity for resilience and rebuilding shattered lives, literally. What nobody really foresaw, or I guess we're too busy living to be considering is what happens when it's paired with age-related challenges. So loss of family members due to old natural aging and dying, death and dying, was something they hadn't experienced. And they didn't have models of older adults. Mostly they proceeded with their adult lives without parents, aunts and uncles, et cetera. So it was a new model and new trauma that they hadn't experienced. And people working with older adults had to be aware of this. Their families, their adult children had to try and understand this and work with it. And then when you add on age-related illness like dementia, where you forget short-term memories and survivors might then forget that they had some good happy years in there and had some lovely grandchildren and fine adult, successful adult children, and they're thrown back into their years of persecution and incarceration, life at that point can become a living nightmare. So immediately we learned we had to treat survivors who had to come into long-term care or became involved in medical, the medical world. We had to treat them differently and individually. And I guess everybody who's aging and needs medical support should be treated differently and individually, but this was one unique group. And we continue to learn. We're learning now from their adult children who are also approaching old age that some trauma is transferable. So it's a heartbreaking thing for me that it seems that what has come out of the Holocaust and the horrific experience is that perhaps other groups who have post-Holocaust been also perse persecuted and experienced genocide and severe trauma may have caregivers and a population that cares a little bit more and a little bit better. And this has been one of the driving goals that compelled all of us to just keep going in this really challenging work. So we have been learning about trauma and the world hasn't become less of a traumatic place. I'm going to play, do some more music up next. This next suite of songs is based on Molly Applebaum's diary and memoir, Buried Words. Molly Applebaum is a 92-year-old Holocaust survivor who lives in Toronto. During the war, she was buried underground in a box on a farm in Dombrova, Poland. It's about an hour away from Krakow. It has a, and the, the farmer buried Molly along with her cousin in a barn with a small hole to breathe through because he was afraid that neighbors might see that he was hiding Jews, and that was an offense punishable by death by the Nazis. Molly, who was just 12 years old at the time, kept a diary of her ordeal, which was later published as a book called Buried Words, and she described in it the cold, the hunger, the filth, being covered with insects and isolation. She was born 
uh, on October 27, 1930 in Krakow, Poland. By 1941, Jews were being rounded up and sent to killing centers, including Belzec. And Molly's mother saw what was happening. So her mother, Sarah, had arranged for a place for Molly and her cousin, Helen, to hide with this farmer. Molly was hoping that her best friend, Sabina, would join her in hiding. Molly and Sabina, Molly had a crush on Sabina, and they had hung out in this empty shoe store in the town of Dombrova. Um, but Sabina refused to go. She wrote a letter to Molly explaining her decision, and Molly kept this letter the rest of her life um, until recently when she sent it to the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And in the letter, Sabina wrote that she had to stay with her parents who were in poor health and that she would have whatever fate in life that her parents would have. But she urged Molly to do everything humanly possible to survive. Sabina knew that she was going to die most likely, and she wrote this letter in a way to give Molly hope and inspiration that she could get through this. Um, a friend of mine, a professor of history at the University of Toronto, Doris Bergen, um, who's the author of War and Genocide, uses Molly Applebaum's book in her courses. And she describes this letter as a hand reaching from death to life, trying to give Molly strength to survive what she knows is going to be an extremely difficult ordeal. This next song is based on that letter. This is Sabina's letter. Sabina was murdered the next week after she wrote this. Stell dir vor die Krom gepackt mit Säure und du gehst in Schule mit mir. Wenn nicht und Hobbchen nicht gehen Mäure, stell dir vor ich läufer weg mit dir. Sie gedenkst noch Lehrers und Examen. Sie gedenkst das Shirley Temple Film. Wenn ich nicht mir seinen doch zusammen. In der mich fest wie zurück mit Jahren viel. Und kein Hoffnung. Er stege die alte Leute. Kein Schumor. Es ist vorbei schon die Zeit, war die Hoffnung. Bakumen hat oder Deutsch, das Leben gehört nicht uns mehr, nur dem Deutsch. Thomas überlebt a jid. Kommen noch in Krieg, wenn auch die Deutschen von Farin kuschen seine Tritt. Kann ich losen, ob mein Mama tasse. Mäusen weg ist du, fahr sie, fahr mir. Ob er du in unser Lebensdrame. Leb und nicht vergess, ich bin mit dir und kein Hoffnung. Ich stege die alte Leute, kein Schum Hoffnung. Es ist vorbei schon die Zeit, war die Hoffnung. Gehört 
nicht uns mehr, noch dem Deutsch. Dacht sich, sie haben recht, die Deutschen. Thomas Ibelella jedem Krieg. Kuschen seine Fies, wollen sie gewiss. Herr Metzer, ich weiß, so dumm ein Krieg. Kenn ich los, ob mein Tate Mame. Es ist euch uns ein Weg, was ihr gewinnen. Du schreib den Koi, seine Spalle euch. Wird euch wieder treffen sie. Sabina's letter and that last line of the song and the last line of the letter, Sabina's hoping that she'll get to see Molly again in this lifetime. Now, Molly spent two years buried underground on this farm in Poland with just a small hole to be breathe through and almost no light. At those rare times in the day when li enough light would come through that hole, she was able to write in her diary. And she, in the, this, these songs based on her experiences, really open up a window as to what it was like for a child during the war. I wanna ask Lenka a question. A little later, we're gonna hear more about a project, very special project that she's involved with that just won a Juno Award. That's Canada's highest music award called um, thieves of dreams. Lenka is a daughter and a granddaughter of a Holocaust of Holocaust survivors. So before we get to that, I want to ask you just personally to share with everyone what it is like to sing these songs, especially from that perspective growing up um, as your mother and grandmother are survivors. My mom and my grandmother were, I think, quite typical of many survivors not talking about their experiences of the Holocaust at all. Never, I, I don't think I've ever heard my grandmother actually say even the word Terezin, which is where they were incarcerated. My mother wrote a book about it, Fortress of My Youth, which was uh, when I was in my 30s. And I myself never even knew I was Jewish until I was 10. So uh, being now part of this project and other Holocaust music is extremely both difficult, revealing, and gratifying to me because I feel uh, I am claiming back some of that heritage and some of that past that was lost because actually my family assimilated four generations ago and I'm going back to where at once they would have been and actually through the knowledge of Holocaust just uh, uh, making that part of my life and identity so it's uh, extremely important to me. So we're going to do another song up next from Molly's diary and this is a unique perspective of a child during the Holocaust, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone the next year, or as this year the war would drag on and on. Early on, when she was 12, in this diary, she wrote a very moving poem. And this became the first song we recorded for this project. And it's the poem is basically how the world is so large, how there's a place for every living creature and every human on the planet has a place on the earth. And she contemplates maybe there's life on the moon or other places, but there's no place on earth for these two Jewish girls who were buried underground in a box, so cramped that they can't sit up. They see it as a grave. And at the end she asks, will we ever see the surface of the earth again? When we set this to music, we uh, combined it with a very famous Yiddish song called Viehin Zolkein that was written about this time that became popular after the war. And it addressed similar themes because this was a very common 
uh, thing that was going through anyone who was Jewish, that there just seemed to be no safe place in the world for Jews via Hines Olegain, Lincoln like Lichtenberg, the Piedora Tango Ensemble, Rebecca Wolkstein, and Robert Horvath. Nas miejsca zabrakło u Ahin Nie wielki, myślą go nie obejmiesz. Prawie że cała ziemia zamieszkana jest przez ludzi. Wszyscy mają swoje miejsce. Na powierzchni ziemi, czym dadzą na świat wiś. Ciemno duszno ja w grobie, dla nas miejsca zabrakło. underground Molly and her cousin Helen suffered from all those horrible things from the filth and the loneliness and the fear of being discovered they also suffered from cold terrible cold in the winter this next song written by Rebecca Wolkstein is uh, a dream is about a dream that she had of a warm blanket that would cover them from head to toe and help them survive the winter.
Der Winter gehen im Dickerum und böse Winden blossen und wehen um es um. Wach nur in der Tag eiskalte Nacht, der Sonne ist die Kälte. Der Wind zieht er und ich mein Guf in der Verfreuen der Welt. Mein Holm ist ein Kohldrehl, wo's bedeckt mich Kopf bis Fies. Oi, wie sie seinen Gewäumes, wenn die Wahrheit es ist. Wenn zugedeckt die Griebe und fort es nackt die Kerl, Mir hungert's noch a cold in a far-freuener Welt. Kein Pelz, kein Mantel helfen nicht, heut so sein zehnmal zehn. Denn es helft diese Bläuse Goldre, dem Winter zu überstehen. Was bedeckt mich Kopf bis Fies? Oi, wie sie seinen Halloimens, wenn die Warenkeit ist. Um sie ist die Spekulatie, als sie ist mich leumerst warm. Sich wahre Männer zerbratze, was hilft nicht mein Hastam? Kein Pelz, kein Mantel helfen nicht, es hilft kein Streu, kein Hey. Heulen deine guten Menschen, so groß einen See. Bitter Winter, composed by Rebecca Wolkstein. Now, Rebecca, I wanted to ask you to share with our audience what it was like composing for this project. You wrote the music for a number of songs, including this last one. We heard Bitter Winter about Molly Applebaum when she was a child, what it was like buried underground. And we heard earlier Silent Tears about a mother being separated from her children. Can you talk about that both as a composer and a mother? So um, I have three young children and I was writing this music during the worst of the pandemic. And so the kids were all home for virtual school and uh, to, to uh, even be able to understand the feeling of a mother who had lost uh, her children in the woods, I could only imagine the most um, minimal experience that I had had that any mother or father would have 
maybe you can't find your child at the park and uh, and that that fear that uh, passing hopefully uh, experience of that fear and so then I thought okay how about if it was 10 times worse or maybe a thousand times worse and so I, I tried to take my own experience which was nothing like these women and to try to the best that I could use that life experience and my imagination and uh, musically I went to conservatory and university and um, spent many many years studying the great composers and uh, I had over 300 years of music to draw upon that I had studied very very seriously and so if I wanted to find a a way to express a certain emotion it, I found that it was in me somewhere and I think that a lot of a lot of that was from my classical training but also from my tango uh, experience having had a tango band now for 10 years and actually just in one piece in one tango you often will travel the gamut of emotions which is one of the things that drew me to the music I love romantic violin playing and it offered that and then on top of that the elegance and um, it, the all of the things that I took from Jewish music tango classical music and um, other styles of music I played I tried to create a new language with this music to try to bring to life these women's experiences. Now, up next, we're going to hear music from another composer, Lenka Lichtenberg, uh, recently won just a few weeks ago the Juno Award, which is the highest, as I mentioned, the highest music award here in Canada, for another album dealing with women's experiences during the Holocaust. It's called Thieves of Dreams. And that was about her grandmother who had written poetry while incarcerated in Theresienstadt. So Lenka, can you uh, talk a little about this whole project and the next song we're going to hear? As I mentioned just before, my grandmother has never said a word about even being in a concentration camp. So when I found in my mother's desk after her passing, uh, some six years ago, when I found two booklets that turned out to be filled with poetry that my grandmother wrote while she was incarcerated in Terezin, it was an immense surprise to me because I, I, I didn't know that she wrote poetry and she just seemed to be really, ha she seemed to have really moved on after the war uh, to a completely different life and never, never dwelling on her experience. So this all was new to me. And I've decided to, uh, rather than put these booklets into a museum, to to try to bring them to the world and give them a little bit of a new life uh, by introducing people to this poetry. Uh, the poems are in Czech, and uh, they range from love poems, which is very surprising, to dealing with a relationship, and only some of them are very dark, but uh, very few of the 65 most are actually hopeful and romantic even. The song that we're going to hear is called Kamsmeto uh, Zeshli, which means, what is this place? What is this place? Where have we come to? What happened to the way you used to look at me? Eternally lost we are, eternally redeemed we are. In the darkest of night, remember the sun. Love is the only spring through which life is born. Never have any regrets, never. And just remember that the sun is there for you tomorrow. Oh. Uh -huh. 
ztraceni, věčně spasení. Za nocí nejtmavších na slunce pamatuj, pamatuj. Kam jsme do kam zašli, kam jsme to zašli, kde je, kde Ztraceni, věčně spaseni. Za nocí nejtmavších na slunce pamatuj, pamatuj. Jen v lásce život náš, život náš pramení. Ztraceni, věčně spasení. Za nocí nejtmavších na slunce pamatuj. Za nocí nejtmavších na slunce pamatuj, pamatuj. Lenka Lichtenberg. As we approach the end of the program, we're going to play one more tango. And a lot of you may be wondering why so much of this project is tango. Now, for the music to tell Molly Applebaum's survival stories, we relied very heavily on Polish tango melodies from the 1930s. And tango was extremely popular all over the world in the 1920s and 30s. It had left Argentina and different parts of the world had adapted it in their own way. Warsaw had become the capital of European tango and the world capital of Yiddish tango. Thousands and thousands, over 3,000, were recorded on old 78s. And one of the leading composers of Yiddish tango was Artur Gold, who was born in 1897 in, in Warsaw. And he wrote the music for Sabina's letter that we heard earlier in the program. And he wrote the music um, for the last song we're going to hear called Don't Let Us Starve. Now, when the Nazis took over Poland, one of the first things they did was establish ghettos and, they, and Artur Gold was sent to the Warsaw ghetto and later to the Treblinka Killing Center where he was forced to create a concentration camp orchestra to perform for members of the SS. Now, one other thing that's of note that you may have noticed that the tango that existed in Poland, these Yiddish and Polish tangos, were a little different than the Argentinian tango. You have a lot of Jewish melodies, a lot of Romani music mixed in with the tango. So, 
Artur Gold had created this concentration camp orchestra to perform for the SS, but sadly, he and all the members of his orchestra were murdered there in Treblinka in 1933. In 1943, excuse me. So to introduce this last song, um, once it, it's called Don't Let Us Starve, and I'm going to introduce again Lenka Lichtenberg to tell us about this part of Molly Applebaum's story. We're going to be playing a song Prayer for Rescue, in fact. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I apologize. Uh, We're doing... Okay. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong list. <laughs> it's uh, still by Archer Gold, and it is a tango. <laughs> Just a different one. Prayer for Rescue is based on two entries in the diary of Molly. She wrote these when she was just 11 years old. And she is really angry with God in those entries. She is praying, but God is not listening. God is not even looking at her. And she finds that her prayers are going right up to the sky and falling right down to the mud. Nobody's paying attention. She's also angry at Nazis who have murdered her best friend, Sabina. Nad nami chmury, zbrodnia i gwałt i mrok. Ty tylko patrzysz z góry, albo odwracasz wzrok. Ja się tak rzadko żalą, choć mam do ciebie żalę.
na spadła już na ziemię i skończyło pocze, a jednak proszę ja z nadzieją marną w godzinie czarną czekają. God, give me some more time. I need to revenge Sabina's death. And then I will leave this world knowing that I have fulfilled what I needed to do. prayer for rescue. Now, Molly Applebaum and her cousin Helen were indeed rescued as the Nazis liberated the town of Dombrova in early 1945. Molly's cousin, uh, Helen, ended up immigrating to the United States. Molly immigrated to Canada, not knowing a word of English or anyone in the country. Today, she's 92, has three children, six grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren. Her diary and memoir called Buried Words was published in 2017 by the Azraeli Holocaust Memoir Series, and it won the Wolf Chair Holocaust Studies Student Impact Prize at the University of Toronto. And it is used in Holocaust education courses at top universities all around the world. So I wanna thank our sponsors, uh, the World Music Institute for inviting us. I wanna thank the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Council for the Arts for supporting this project, and most importantly, the incredible musicians who brought this music to life. Robert Horvath here on piano, Rebecca Wolkstein on violin, who composed much of the music for the project, Lenka Lichtenberg, vocalist, and the rest of the team. Uh, I encourage you to check out the album and the videos. Uh, we have Joseph Phillips on double bass, Drew Jureka on bandonian, and violin and he produced the recording and arranged all of the amazing music and there are three other vocalists involved in the project olga avigail moleschuk who lives in israel and grew up in poland and marcia kashorak who uh, is from lodge poland and of course uh, aviva chernik from here in toronto and lenka lichtenberg here tonight and if anyone has any questions for any of the musicians or for Dr. David, um, we have a Q&A and you can just type them in. And um, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight on this special event for Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day on the Jewish calendar. It seems we have a few questions. Can I invite either Gabby or Bryce to read them because they're not popping up on my screen? All right, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, thank you everybody so much. This is was a very moving and, and beautiful presentation. Um, we have one question that was, uh, I think going to everybody in the group saying, what did you experience to be the most challenging and the most rewarding aspects of you know putting this project together okay. um, I guess the the most challenging aspect probably was a piece that we didn't perform today uh, composing a piece called victim of, Kerme of, of Mengele that one was really really uh, a harrowing story and to figure out how to tell any of these stories musically, I would say, I would say that the composing was the most challenging. Um, 
performing the music is uh, is a beautiful experience because the the music is very emotional and uh, I uh, I think the most rewarding part is to is uh, to be able to talk to people who say that it had a, a strong effect on them or that they felt that it was important work to be done that's really gratifying and um, to to feel like we're making sure that people remember these stories. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're unfortunately out of time, but uh, on behalf of everybody at World Music Institute, we wanna thank you for, for sharing this hour with us. And we will, in the follow-up email, share all of the links on where to purchase uh, the record and to find more information about the project. And thank you again. And we hope to see all of you at a future WMI Plus. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.